Who will inherit the kingdom of heaven? Is it those who are highly respected? Those who are the most productive in our world? That will be rewarded with eternal life? Well, we had a good um, little talk here that pretty much covered everything that I can cover <laughs> at the, with the children's talk, didn't we? Our passage starts out with a beautiful story. A beautiful story of parents bringing their children to come and be blessed by Jesus. Can you imagine the crowd and all these parents wanting to bring their children to be blessed by Jesus? And the disciples rebuking them. Take your children away, get, get back. It'd be quite a scene, wouldn't it? And Jesus' voice, let the children come, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. I think culture determines what we value more than we would sometimes hope. Sometimes we let the television tell us what's valuable more than what we determine from the word of God. Sometimes culture tells us that certain careers mean that someone's more valuable than someone who is doing a different career or none at all. Sometimes culture tells us that we're to value certain genders more or certain castes of people or certain races of people more than others. Sometimes our culture will preference mature adults over children or sometimes over elderly. What about you? Who are the most valuable people in Engadine? What determines our value? In Indonesia, children are highly valued. You'll often see a parent running around after their child on the play equipment, even at McDonald's, like the kids will just be playing and the mums will be running around hand feeding their kids. And it, it's quite hilarious, but they don't want to interrupt their play and they want them to have sustenance. Children are valuable. If you said that there's a blessing up for grabs, there would be a huge crowd in our town in. Um, Papua, there would be a huge crowd of people gathered around to try and get a blessing for their child. Children are valuable. Sometimes our children have been touched by pregnant mothers in the hope that their child will have a pointy nose or light-colored skin. However, if there's a religious gathering, the children are to be unseen. They're an interruption. You don't want them to get in the way. I think it's similar to this story with Jesus. I think the disciples thought that the, the children were not worth Jesus' time. They would be a distraction from what he was here on earth to do. But that's not Jesus' heart, is it? He values the children. Let them come, he says. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Remember chapter 18, where Jesus said in verse 3, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who will inherit the kingdom of heaven? Children and those who humble themselves like children. The second scene, as we heard earlier, 
He's a rich young man, has great wealth. He's an upright man in society, doing all the right things. But he asks this question, and us who know the gospel, we know that this question has a great big flaw, don't we? Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? What's the flaw? What's, what's the problem with this question? The answer is nothing, isn't it? You can't do anything to get eternal life. So Jesus answers, Why do you ask me what is good? There's only one who is good. It's a common flaw in humanity, isn't it? For some reason we can... We always think that we can do something towards our salvation. Muslims continually profess their faith. They pray five times a day. They fast a month every year. They go on a pilgrimage to Mecca. They give to the poor. And they do it all in the hopes that they can do something to earn eternal life. It's easy to look at them, though. Look back at us in Australia. Your average person in Australia will think that if you're generally good, if you don't you know, hurt too many people, you don't in, infringe on people's human rights, then God would be unjust, wouldn't he, if he sent you to hell? I find myself doing the same sort of thing feeling like my good deeds or something that I've done might make me more worthy of a relationship with Jesus than others. Sometimes if I've made a mistake, I feel like, ah, can God really forgive me for that? The parable of the workers in the vineyard Adds to our point here, doesn't it? The workers thought that they would receive more for working longer hours. The first were last to receive their wage, and they got their hopes up that they might be getting more than what was first promised. But in the end, they all received the same out of the generosity of the landowner. Rewards in the kingdom of heaven are not what we deserve. The reward you get is not based on what you've done. As much as us humans seem to think that that's what's going to happen, it's turned on its head. Here, if you do eight hours pay, uh, eight hours work, you get eight hours pay. If you do the crime, you get the time, don't you? You get what you need to get for what you do. If we got what we deserved in terms of the kingdom of heaven, we'd all be in big trouble, wouldn't we? (laughs) We'd all be lacking in hope. We'd all be headed for hell. What good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Obedience is within a relationship, isn't it? We can't have obedience unless we have a relationship. And I think that that's why Jesus points out, obey the commandments. The young man zealous. He continues to try and justify himself. He thinks, oh, I've done all these commandments. I'm looking pretty good here. But he seemed to forget that there is only one who is good. 
There is only one who is good, is what Jesus said. Eventually, the young man admits there's something lacking. What do I still lack? What is it that I still lack? Jesus answers, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. The thing that this young man loved more than God, more than following Jesus, was his wealth. And he walked away sad because he wasn't willing to give it up. A guy in Indonesia that we used to uh, that used to work for us, he was um, helping look after our property in Sulawesi and. He heard the gospel many times. Um, And one day he said to me, you know, you're right. The gospel's right. I believe that God became a man. I believe that God died to pay for my sin and that he rose again. But I can't follow Jesus. I said, what? You believe that it's true, but you can't follow Jesus? He said, no. Because my family's important. Honoring my parents, honoring my ancestors is so important. If I follow Jesus, I'd have to leave that behind. And I can't. Sad, isn't it? That someone could meet Jesus and not be willing to follow him, even though they know him. What about you? What would have been the thing that Jesus would have pointed out to you in this situation? What would it be that would stop you from following Jesus? Is it wealth? Like the young man, would you give up your wealth? Is it tradition or family? Like my friend? Or is there something else that's stopping you from following Jesus? During COVID, a lot of these important things have been brought to the front of our minds, haven't they? Some might think that health is more more important than Jesus. I know that when I was sick and in bed, I felt quite hopeless and not very valuable at all when I couldn't help even Belinda to make the kids lunches to send them off to school (laughs) or to contribute anything at home. I could hardly do any ministry for six months almost six months, all I could do was talk to people on the phone. Did that make me less valuable in Jesus' eyes? And yet, as we leaned on Jesus, as we leaned on God for help and for him to help through those situations, even when there were times when I felt like I might die, I could trust in him and know it's okay. I think Belinda was given supernatural ability to have resilience at that time and to serve us all, to serve others around in other parts of um, Indonesia, which is part of her job as area leader. She was able to continue to do that. And I think it's just because of God's grace that she was able to do so much. Would bad health make you doubt God and turn away? Or would it push you towards him and make you trust in him more? 
Maybe financial security or job security is a thing for you guys. Maybe it's your mobile phone. Oh, just let, let me check Instagram before I have my quiet time. Oh no, I haven't got time anymore. Off we go to work. Does your phone steal time away from God? Away from important things that God wants you to do? Sometimes um, I'm at an office and like waiting. And you used to be able to talk to people quite easily. But now everyone's staring at their phone. And it makes it more difficult to share the gospel in the ways that we're used to. (laughs) Is it comfort and convenience that would stop you from following Jesus? Would you be willing to sell your house in a nice neighborhood to move somewhere a little less nice, but where you could be more of a witness to the neighbors? Would you sell your house in the Shire to move to Bankstown or to um, Lakemba so that you could be a witness amongst migrants if God wanted you to do that? Would you move overseas for him if he asked you? What would have Jesus said to you in this situation? The young man had great wealth, so God asked him, to sell it and follow Jesus. Is there something that you would rather have than following Jesus? When we're in Bible college, Belinda said, you know, I could go anywhere in the world, but not to Indonesia and not to work with Muslims. And um, I have to laugh now, don't I? Our friends asked us to join a Muslim prayer group. So we started praying for Muslims and God changed our hearts and different things happened and we ended up in Indonesia. Belinda loves working in Indonesia and she loves our friends there. God changes hearts. It's up to us. How are we willing to submit those things to him? So we need to humble ourselves like children to enter the kingdom of heaven. We need to put God first and follow Jesus, even when it means sacrificing things that are important to us. Verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus took them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Sometimes when we go out and do evangelism, we think that a well-crafted set of speech, set of words might convince someone to come to Christ. Or maybe, maybe it's a good debate, a good, you know, a good way to debate the truth so that they'll be convinced by my arguments. Sometimes we think if we just say the right thing, then this person in front of us will believe. Jesus says, with man no one can be saved, but with God all things are possible. It's not about our words. I mean, it's about us getting out there and be willing to be used by God, but it's not about what we say. God gives us words. One of the ways that 
we've often done outreach in the last few years is to go on prayer walks. But I call it an inclusive prayer walking. I don't know how it would work in Australia, but we just walk down the street in Indonesia and we see a, a gathering of people up ahead and we'll pray for them as we walk along. But then we'll approach them. We'll approach them and we'll start talking to them and we'll say, look, we're praying for the area. Do you want to pray with us? We invite them in to pray. One day there was some guys in front of a mosque and we went and asked them, do you want to pray with us? What? (laughs) They were kind of shocked. Yeah, we're praying for your community. This is a a gathering point for your community, and we want to pray for people. And so we did. We prayed together with these guys out in front of a mosque for the people, and were able to pray for everyone who visits the mosque that they would know God well, that they would come close to God right there amongst them. One time we met some women, and, you know, we're just walking along, and we come up and ask a group of women, is there something we can pray for you? We see tears coming to their eyes. One woman shares about her son who has just started drinking and gets violent with her. Yes, please pray for my son. Another woman says, my husband's cheating on me. We pray for them. And it opens the door. You see the Holy Spirit at work amongst them. And they don't feel pressured by us coming as though they would. You know, sometimes when you come to do evangelism, there's this tension. <laughs> and people feel like they're, the, they're there to be evangelized sort of thing. But when you come to pray for someone and you genuinely care about them and you, you listen and you ask them about their problems, provides a unique opportunity and it has allowed God's spirit to work in them in ways that we haven't anticipated and start some beautiful discipleship relationships in ways that we wouldn't have thought of doing otherwise. Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. When Abraham was asked by God to leave everything in you, to go to the promised land, he packed and he left, didn't he? When Elisha was asked to go and join Elijah, what did he do? He went and sacrificed his oxen. He kissed his parents goodbye and he joined Elijah. When Jesus said to his disciples, come, follow me, they left their nets, they left their jobs, they left things behind and they followed Jesus. Are you following Jesus with your whole life? If we look at what Peter says in verse 27, I kind of wonder, was he thinking that he may have deserved something more than others? Was the parable of the worker in the vineyard aimed at Peter? (laughs) Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Do you think that Jesus gave the parable of the workers in the vineyard to address Peter? Maybe, I'm not sure, but it's possible. Was Peter hoping to have greater reward than others because of something he'd done? Was he like one of the workers who'd been there for 12 hours and was hoping for more than the workers for one hour? But the gracious and very generous gift that Jesus talks about in verses 28 to 29 
are for all who follow Jesus, aren't they? We're all valuable in God's eyes. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Are we willing to humble ourselves like children? Will you follow Jesus no matter what the cost is? There is nothing you can do to make you deserve eternal life. But you're valuable in God's eyes. Our gracious and generous God wants to bless you. Will you follow Jesus with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're continually challenged by your word. We're continually challenged to look to you, and yet we look other places so often. Please purify our hearts. Help us to see you as you are and to follow you with everything that we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.